<clears throat> okay, guys, I'm here at my brother's home for now where the internet connection is not the strongest because I don't make the money that David Wood makes. He's rolling in the dough, top-notch technology, computers, you name it. That's what you get when you're a dictator. All right, David getting roasted. Yeah, I know, it's clickbait. I know, man. Ain't I a stinker? <clears throat> Why not attract some of his haters? All right. So we can blow up. Welcome, everyone. Caldina Syrian, Truth Apologetics, Daily Light, all of you. God bless you. <clears throat> Eric the Kef, Libertas et Veritas, Liberty and Truth. Right. Guys, if you're up for it, I may do two sessions one on the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in response to anti Trinitarians, and another on whether the Quran is the Word of God, the Word of the true God, like I did yesterday. That's up to you. Let's see. How the Spirit will lead as the Holy Spirit fills me, fills us, not just me, every one of us, for the glory of Jesus Christ. We'll just wait a few more minutes, and <clears throat> we'll begin. John McDermott, how are you, brother? Another day in the line for the Shemunian Bat Batarama. Thank you, Sam. Do you, do you want me to set up a line for you so people can call you? A line for two? That's, a, that's the Greek... Genitive form of the definite article two. Two is the Greek genitive of ho or ha. So you have to finish. To what? To theu, to kiriu. What are you talking about? Any books you have or you recommend? Yes. Are you from Armenia? Shadow, I'm Assyrian. Not from Syria. I'm Assyrian. I'm Ashuraya. The Lord Jesus made me an Assyrian. Ashuraya, and I'm from a particular branch of Assyrians called Jilu. I'm from the Jilu tribe, but within that tribe, there are various clans. I am Ziria. <clears throat> Ziria. How would you say that in another language? Ziria, Jilwa, Sura. Right? Anyway, Sam, do you want me to? I'm just kidding, Dale. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, should I try that now? But see, if I try that now, then I can't get into my discussion. Brother, what's your take on the Trinity? Soldier of Christ. Pins and needles. Needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Pins and needles. Needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Folks, why would a Christian who comes to my channel for a while... Ask me, what's my take on the Trinity? When my YouTube channel is filled with sessions proving beyond any reasonable doubt by the grace of the Holy Spirit that the Trinity is a revelation of the Bible, the true God is triune, and my websites or the websites I write for, contribute, are filled with articles or battles proving the Trinity. No, soldier of Christ, I've seen you before because that name is familiar unless you've stolen someone's nick. Have you stolen someone's nick? You're not the only soldier of Christ. There have been soldiers of Christ here before. Uh, and John Lee, do you really want to get schooled? Because it's called a prophetic perfective, where future events are spoken of in the past as a reality that the prophet is seeing being displayed before his eyes. Because you have the past tense verbs used even in Isaiah 53 and in other passages that clearly refute to future events. So John Lee, if you're one of these anti-Trinitarian heretics, you're going to get schooled badly, so don't wax eloquent, okay? So I don't know who you are, but that's a typical, typical anti-Trinitarian, anti-Christian <clears throat> deception. Anyone who knows Hebrew will tell you that Hebrew is what's known as a verbal aspectual a a lang uh, language, that you don't necessarily look to the tense of the verb and assume that the tense of the verb, just because it's past, isn't referring to a present or future reality. So don't wax eloquent, my friend. You're going to embarrass yourself, John Lee, because I think you're one of those anti-Trinitarian, anti-Christian <clears throat> nuisances that trying to Attack the Christian faith in the guise of a question. You're going to humiliate yourself. I'm telling you. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And by the way, Hater Wood, David Wood, I encouraged him. 
I encouraged him to, when he starts making T-shirts for his hater club, to make that shirt that he said he wanted to make. I got blocked by Sam Shimon. I got blocked by Sam Shimon. Now, I don't know where my buddy Protestant believer is. Hold on. Hold on. Well, I can't contact him. Hold on. Hold on one second. Protestant believer usually. Oh, you're here. Okay, brother. I was like, I didn't see you. Do you see how John Lee thought he was uh, slick? See, he's like the serpent, very subtle. Yeah, what do you think about Isaiah 9, 6? Why is the future tense verbs when the Hebrews past tense verbs? Go study a book on Hebrew grammar. There's something called the prophetic perfective, where verbs, though past tense, <clears throat> are actually referring to future phenomenon because the prophet is called a seer. One of the names of a prophet in the Hebrew Bible is a seer because not only does the spirit tell him the future, the Holy Spirit actually shows him the future and he sees the future as a past reality, though it's in the future. Nice try, John Lee. Notice John Lee went silent. Right. Soldier of Christ, why would I have book recommendations? What I just said, brother. Soldier, listen then. I just said this YouTube channel and other YouTube channels, like Anthony Rogers, who was here earlier. At 17 Apologetics, this channel, we have dozens of videos, in-depth sessions on the Old and New Testament basis for the triunity of God, showing that the Bible clearly teaches three eternally distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that Jesus is the God-man. And also the articles and rebuttals on my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, and answeringislam.net, as well as in answeringmuslims.com, where Anthony Rogers, one of the top, one of the best Trinitarian apologists we have in the world, contributes. So why would you need books when you got everything free of charge? So Daily Light, you don't love me anymore? So you only love me on Jesus or Muhammad? By the way, folks, this is the article that I will be basing my session on. Let me tell you what the session is. If you guys want, I'll do two sessions. Two sessions. Lord willing, I'm going to do a session rebutting Chris LaSala and his distortion of Malachi 3 verse 1. And if you want, God willing, when I'm done, I can then do a session on the Quran, not possibly being the word of God, the word of the true God, part two. If you guys are interested, if you're interested, I'll do two sessions. We'll do a, a second part in my series on the Quran, not being the word of the true God. Okay. Not being the word of the true God. That's up to you guys. Sam, can you tell me where I can post my questions to you? Well, you can post here for now, and hopefully it will be relevant. So you guys, are you guys ready? Yep, that's right. Bruce Lee, the man. You guys ready to go into, hopefully, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in-depth exegesis? And this is clickbait. Obviously, I use David Wood's name, but there's some truth to it. Haterwood was here, so hopefully he's listening. He can't explain the Bible if his life was, the, you know, <clears throat> dependent on it. So I have to bail him out. I've been carrying him for all these years, and my back is about to give up because I can't carry all that weight. Uh, that weight, he's too much weight to handle. But I will endure for the grace, by the grace of God, for the love of my brother. Right. But anyway, with that said, what do I want to do? I want to address Malachi chapter three one, particularly because let me give you a little background, and we'll begin in a word of prayer. Right, you guys remember my interaction with Chris Lasala, right? You guys remember Chris Lasala? You remember my interaction with him? Well, we had three discussions, two of which he recorded and posted on his YouTube channel. Now, thank the Lord Jesus, I know Protestant believer, and by the way, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Protestant believer. I think he downloaded the discussions. I know another brother did as well. We had a discussion on whether Jesus is Jehovah. <clears throat> it didn't go too well for him or his friend. In fact, he even told me that his friend who had joined him was so was shaken so badly, right? Yep, shaken so badly that he had to go back and now start studying more deeply about these issues because he got rocked so bad. His friend got shaken so badly that he became discouraged and engaging in discussions. 
That was Chris LaSala's own word to me, because in the second discussion, we had a discussion on whether Jesus still exists in a body of flesh, a glorified physical body of flesh. Now, here's where Chris LaSala showed his true colors. I was trying to be very gracious with the hopes that God would use me to bring him into the fullness of the truth of the Trinity and other issues. The second session he recorded was on Skype, and he downloaded it to his YouTube channel, but then he removed it. But thank God, I think two brothers downloaded to their YouTube channel. Now, this is what he did. In that discussion, you'll hear him near the end of the discussion saying, okay, you're right, I admit, soul sleep is not a biblical teaching. Up until that point, he used to believe in soul sleep, that when you die, you cease to consciously exist, right? So he changed, he recanted, repented, of his position in our discussion, right? Are you with me there? In our discussion. And he posted on YouTube. Then we did a third discussion because he came up with a lengthy, quote unquote, rebuttal to my use of Malachi 3.1 to prove that Jesus is identified as Jehovah God. So we did a third session on Skype. And again, I was refuting his misinterpretation of Malachi 3.1. When the discussion was done, guess what happened? Now, remember, in the two previous sessions we did on Skype, he recorded it. He recorded both of them. As the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue to speak clearly for the glory of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. We finished the discussion. Guess what? He never recorded it. No, no, he didn't even record it. Not delete it. I assume he was recording the discussion. When it's done, I go, so when are you going to post this discussion? He goes, oh, I didn't record it. I go, what? You seriously didn't record the discussion? He never did. You believe that? And then he showed his true colors after that. And so now the gloves are off. I'm not interested in being nice or gracious to Chris Lasala because I gave him the benefit of the doubt. But he exposes true colors because that man, I have to be honest, is demonized. May the triumph God grant him mercy and open his eyes. If not, may the Lord Jesus give him what he deserves. So I'm now going to respond to his distortion of Malachi 3, verse 1. I'm going to show you how Malachi 3, 1 is a nightmare for Unitarians, is a nightmare for anti-Trinitarians, and is a glorious passage, a glorious <clears throat> Old Testament text that shows the coming one is God Almighty in the flesh and yet distinct from the Father. Are you guys ready for that? And then Lord willing... Once we finish this session, I can do a second session on why the Quran cannot be the word of the true God, if you're interested. That's up to you guys. Let's do this first session, trusting the triumph God to anoint the session for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Father. And we love you, Lord Jesus. And we love you, Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Father, for our shortcomings. Forgive us for succumbing to the flesh. And forgive us for all the sins that we are aware of, and even the sins we commit in ignorance, wash us in the blood of Jesus and fill us with the Spirit. And by the power and life from your Spirit, crucify our flesh to walk in the life of the Spirit, to be filled with fruit from the Spirit, and fill us with wisdom and knowledge from the Spirit, and faithfulness and trust in you from the Spirit, and holiness and purity and love and compassion and mercy, Father. We need more of the Holy Spirit to fill us, Father. Less of us, more of your Spirit filling us, to transform us, to conform to the image of your son, your heart that became flesh. Please, Father, help us to truly love you the way you deserve to be loved, to be in love with you, to be in love with Jesus, even in love with your spirit, apart from whom we cannot do this. And Father, please anoint this session, anoint the words of my mouth to speak truth without error, without stammering and confusion, and enable me to recall and exegete your word perfectly. And anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants, Father. They're here because they trust that your spirit will use me to bless them. They're not here for me, Father. They're not, Lord. I have too many issues and perfections for them to be here for me. They're here because they love you, Father. They love your son, the Lord Jesus. They trust and love your spirit to use imperfect vessels such as myself to speak to them and bless them. So bless them, Father. Fill us. Fill our loved ones. Fill my daughters with your spirit, with your presence, with your love, and cover us by the blood of Jesus. And fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this. And destroy any attacks of the enemy to focus on you. And even bless the internet connection, Father. And bless my brothers and sisters in the battlefield. All the brothers and sisters who are doing evangelism, 
apologetics, whether on YouTube or other social medias or out there in the streets. Bless them, Father. Bless them and preserve them. Bless my, my brothers and sisters in the ministry, Father. Bless us all and our loved ones. Give us the power to finish the race with integrity, with honor, to never shame you and never fail you, Father. But to glorify you in our lives and even in our deaths to bring you glory that you deserve. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, Son, Spirit. <clears throat> okay, here's the article that I'll be basically not so much using, but my arguments will be found in this article. So, guys, click the link, read that article. And it's actually refuting Joe's witnesses and showing how the Joe's witnesses indirectly, not directly, not meaning to, testified that Jesus is Jehovah God. You, you, you know that? They implicitly, not meaning to, confirmed that Jesus is Jehovah God. Now, for my brother John Lee, are you still here? John Lee? Are you here? Just want to make sure before I begin. Okay, brother, if you are a Trinitarian and a Christian who loves the Lord, my apologies. I don't recognize your name, but because I am trigger happy, because I'm used to anti-Trinitarians coming and bringing up objections that they think are strong, I assumed you may have been maybe an anti-Christian missionary. Not a missionary, but you know, you know what I mean. The rabbis that are so forgive me, brother. I didn't know you're a Trinitarian who loves Jesus. I'm asking a sincere question. So I thought you're here to do a hit and run. Okay. So John Lee, let me repeat this. And don't take my word for this. There's something in the Hebrew language called the prophetic, prophetic perfective. This is known by all scholars, not just Christians. Where prophets, because they're called seers. If you go in the Old Testament, a prophet is also called a seer. Okay. Why is he called a seer? Because the Holy Spirit not only gives the prophets the words to say, the Holy Spirit actually shows them the future. And as they see the future and they write it down from their perspective, the future event is already taking place in their mind. So they're writing about a future event as if it's in the past. And you find this all throughout the Old Testament. So don't let anyone mislead you, John Lee, that because a verse uses past tense verbs, it cannot be referring to the future. Even the rabbis know that's a lie from the pit of hell. Is that clear? Yes, John Lee, Isaiah 53. Read Isaiah 53, and it's past tense. Isaiah's talking about this already happening. It's all in the past. Right? So don't let them deceive you, John Lee. I didn't know because I don't recognize everyone. But like I said, if you're asking sincere questions and you're not trying to cause trouble or you're being a nuisance, then I will answer, especially if it's related to the topic. But if you're here to cause trouble and debate, this is not the forum. And if you're not getting a point, just let me be clear again. Guys, I cannot make myself see. The wisdom and knowledge of the scriptures are a gift of God's grace. I cannot understand the scriptures and plumb the depths of scriptures unless the Holy Spirit enables me. So if I can't make myself understand scripture, I can't make you see. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is pleased in his timing to help you progress and mature in your understanding. That's why some people progress faster than others because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit may be working in you and through you at a slower pace than someone else. Don't be frustrated. Don't lose hope. Trust in the Holy Spirit and be patient. Be patient. God has taught me one thing in these past two years is patience. And I hate to be patient. I hate to be patient. I want something like yesterday. And God has forced me out of my comfort zone and forced me to be still and shut up. Do you know what passage God has been giving me for two years? And I have yet to see what God has in store for me yet, because I'm still not out of my problems, out of my shackles. I'm still going through it for over two years. Okay. And the passage he's, he's been giving me is Exodus 14, 14. Jehovah fights for you. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. Sit back. And you know what, folks? Every time I've tried to do something in my own strength with my own wisdom in my flesh, 
God has disciplined me and it's imploded in my face. And guys, I'll be honest, I'm human, I'm sinful. It sucks being patient. It sucks. It sucks not knowing if I'll ever see my kids. It sucks being alone, not having a godly companion, right? It sucks having to wake up every day and find things to do, right? So I can keep myself occupied so I don't start thinking about my children, how much I miss them. But even though it sucks, lack, lack of an eloquent term, even though it sucks, I can testify. I can testify. There is a joy and a love and a peace and a calmness that fills me daily in spite of everything else. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. Exactly, Holy Tornado. He's more interested in my holiness conforming to Jesus than my comfort. Because God has said, in this world, it's not about your comfort. It's about you conquering the world, overcoming the world, and being like Jesus. Right? So just to, just to let you know. So John Lee, my apologies, brother. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive and cause anyone to stumble. I truly do want to love you guys and bless you guys, but I am a work in progress and I have issues. So sorry, I thought you're one of those who's trying to attack. So hope that helped you understand, John Lee, right? Don't be impressed or overwhelmed or intimidated by people who claim to know the languages of the Bible. Don't. Trust in the Holy Spirit. Trust in the Holy Spirit. And John Lee, always when you're confronted with something, you say, Holy Spirit, I know you are God. I know you're real. And by faith, right, I know you are in me and with me. We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't depend or, or base things on what we see, because if we do, we're going to lose faith and turn away. But we base things on God's word, on God's character, on God's promises. No matter what happens, God is real. He is truth, cannot lie. The Holy Spirit is alive. He's in me, and I'm going to trust. So you say, Holy Spirit, please guide me and give me wisdom to know what the answer is. And be patient and wait. Be patient and wait. Be patient and wait. Right? Is that clear? So with that said, let's go into Malachi 3 verse 1. Now here's my article again. Click on the link. Click on the link. Save this article. Study it. Download it. Use it. Okay. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Let's go into the meat of Scripture. More proof from the Old Testament that God is multi-personal and that the Messiah to come is God in the flesh. Malachi 3, verse 1. Let's read. Thank the admins for helping me to help you, serving me to serve you. Right? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Hey, Protestant, sums up with your uh, software because behold has an E at the end. And uh, me has two E's. What's up with these E's? A lot of E's. You guys see it? All these E's? I think it's 1611 Shakespeare in English. He's wrong. But anyway. Yep. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to the temple, his temple. Yeah, this guy is quoting Old English. Bro, what happened? He's quoting one of these translations that's written... Uh, 17th century English style. What happened, man? Protestant? You trying to teach me something? How are you, brother Alan? What's up, bro? Okay. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Jehovah of hosts. Okay, let's break this down. A prophecy. Malachi is right, right, written around the time of the construction of the second temple. So this is going to be fulfilled during the second temple. Don't forget the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Guys, make sure you're following with me and let me know that you're trucking along so I don't lose you as we trust the Spirit to illuminate us. Okay. Something amazing is going to take place during the second temple. What's amazing? 
God is going to send a messenger to prepare for him. God is saying, I'm going to send someone, a messenger, a messenger of mine to prepare for me. Once that messenger shows up, suddenly after that messenger, the Lord will come to his temple. Let's break it down. The Lord in Hebrew is, ha and by the way, Ab al Halij, he reads Hebrew and Aramaic, and he'll confirm. It's Ha Adan or Ha Adon. Ha Adon. Don't forget that. Ha Adon. This is all in my article. Let me give you the link again. Let's go into meat because you guys like, love meat. You want steak. You want Wagyu steak. Okay. Let me give you the interlinear. For yourselves, I'm not making this up. Even in my article, I even quote the Jehovah's Witness 1984 reference edition of their scriptures that admits that this phrase, Ha'adon, is only used of Jehovah God in the Hebrew Bible. I want you to see it for yourself. Hold on. Okay, here you go. Thank God for modern technology. Okay, here you go. Click on that. Guys, please take a moment. It may not be as entertaining, but I want to be educational so that as you plumb the depths of Scripture, the Holy Spirit will cause you to be in awe, in awe of the depth and beauty of the Scriptures and how amazing our God is and how beautiful Jesus is. Click on it. You're going to see for yourself. There goes the phrase Ha-Adon. It's right there, the Lord. Ha Adon. It's transliterated as H A, that's the definite article in Hebrew, Ha, the, and Adon, A D O W N. You can omit the W and just say Adon or Adan. Do you guys see it? Do you guys see that? Ha Adon. I want to make sure you see it. Okay, if you see it, if you see it, this phrase, these two words, ha adan, ha adon, are never used for anyone other than Jehovah, the true God. Let me repeat. These two words, this exact phrase, is only used for the true God. It's never used for a creature. And here's all the occurrences of this term. Here it is. Exodus 23, 17, Exodus 34, 23, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 24, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 10, 16, Isaiah chapter 19, verse 4, Micah chapter 4, verse 13, and Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. All of this is in the article, okay? This word, Ha'adon, is only used of the true God, Jehovah. It's never used of a creature. Let's look at just two occurrences. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 24, and Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. Isaiah 1, 24, and Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. Okay. Therefore saith the Lord. Guess what the word the Lord is? The Lord of hosts, Jehovah of hosts. Therefore saith Ha-Adon. Who is Ha-Adon? Who is Ha-Adon? Jehovah of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Now notice Isaiah 3 verse 1. For behold, the Lord, Hebrew, ha-adon, ha-adon. And who is the, the Lord? Jehovah of hosts. Doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So the first point you need to get, the phrase ha-adon, ha-adon, the two words, ha-adon, are never used of a creature. They're only used of Jehovah God Almighty. You guys get it? Never used of a creature. Only used of Jehovah God Almighty. The second proof that this one who's coming to the temple is Jehovah God, let's look at Malachi 3 verse 1 one more time. Malachi 3 verse 1 one more time. Jehovah is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Come on, Daryl. You've been with me long enough to ask me that question. Come on, man. Jehovah is the name for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's like asking me, is Adam the male or the female? Is Adam the husband of Eve or is it Eve? Come on, brother. You've been with me long enough. I love you, man. I know you're an intelligent guy. You know this. You know this. That's why I'm saying, come on. 
It's not like you're some guy who doesn't know scripture. You know the scriptures. Jehovah is the name for the true God. And if the Father is the true God, then he's Jehovah. If the Son is the true God, then he's Jehovah. If the Holy Spirit is the true God, then he's Jehovah. Right? You know this, brother. You've been you've been studying scriptures. You know this. Right? Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, Ha'adan, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. So notice, whoever this Lord is, he's coming to his temple. This is the second line of evidence proving that this being is Jehovah God Almighty. Do you know why? Because the temple in Jerusalem was built for Jehovah, not for anyone else, and definitely not for a man. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. First Chronicles 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for Jehovah God. The temple that Solomon will build in Jerusalem is not for a man, it's for Jehovah God. Is that clear? Is it sinking in that the Lord, Ha'adan, is coming to his temple? What temple? The second temple in Jerusalem. But the temple in Jerusalem was built for Jehovah God, not for a man, not for a creature. But Malachi 3.1 says, this Lord is coming to his temple. So two things. The phrase, the Lord, Ha'adan, only use of Jehovah, and the fact that he's coming to his temple solidifies, reinforces the fact that this Lord is none other than Jehovah God who will appear in the second temple in Jerusalem. Before I move on, I want it to sink in. <clears throat> Before I move on, I want it to sink in. Yeah. Why did your God commission your prophet to rape women like your mother and prostitute them like whores, calling it muta. Okay. Anyway, that was a Mohammedan, a son of Satan, that I had to put in this place. Okay, now for everyone, did you get it? If there's someone confused, and by the way, radical and everyone else, if you have questions about the divine name, who exactly Jehovah, ask me. The reason why I said Daryl is because Daryl, I know he knows scriptures. I've seen him long enough. And he's familiar with the scriptures. But for everyone else, do you see the clear evidence from Malachi 3.1 that this Lord must be Jehovah God? Because the words, Ha'adan, the Lord, only use of Jehovah. And the fact that he's coming to the temple in Jerusalem and the temple set to be his shows it's Jehovah God. Okay. Now, don't forget what the prophecy said. Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of me. And then the Lord will appear. So it's saying... Two figures are going to show up. A messenger is going to be sent to prepare for the coming of God. And when the messenger shows up, immediately after him, God is going to show up in the temple. Now, according to the New Testament, who is the messenger that it will be sent to prepare for the coming of Ha'adan to his temple? You don't need to guess. You guys already know. Malachi 1, Malachi 1, verses 2 to 4. Malachi 1, verses 2 to 4. Malachi 1, verses 2 to 4. Here, I'm sorry, why did I say Malachi? Mark chapter 1. Man, too many M's. Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Why did I say Malachi? Because we're in the Malachi 3, 1. Haters. Haters. By the way, Protestant, are they listening in Discord? And is our brother Jay Haber there? Let them know to stick around if, he, if they are, because I want to... Talk to him uh, afterwards, yeah, God willing. Anyway, Mark chapter 1. Oh, he'll, he'll, he'll be there. Don't worry about it. Don't hate. He'll be there. Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. We'll skip 1. Let's read 2 to 4. Pay attention. Mark 1, 2 to 4. Read with me. Okay, hold on. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, 
which shall prepare the way before thee. Notice Mark quotes Malachi 3.1. He goes, Malachi 3.1 has been fulfilled, folks, has been fulfilled. And then he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3 and Mark 1.3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Did you guys catch it? And then Mark 1, 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Did you catch what Mark did? Mark says, John the Baptist fulfills Malachi 3, 1 and Isaiah 40, verse 3. John is that messenger that was sent before God, the voice that cries out in the wilderness, according to Isaiah 40, verse 3, preparing people for the Lord who's about to come. So who's the messenger of Malachi 3.1 that would be sent to prepare for the coming of God? John the Baptist. Jesus himself says it's John the Baptist. Matthew 11, verse 10. Matthew 11, verse 10. Matthew 11, verse 10. Jesus speaking of John the Baptist. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold... I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. End of story. Jesus said, John the Baptist is the messenger whom God the Father would send to prepare for my coming. And if you have any doubt that John the Baptist was sent to prepare for Jesus, Acts 19 verse 4. Acts 19 verse 4. Well, Medic, if you go to my article here, oh, sorry, I gave you that. Let me give you the link. You're going to use this against the Jehovah's Witnesses because this is a Jehovah's Witness rebuttal. They have no honest answer. But anyway, Acts 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John very baptized you, verily baptized you with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Did everyone see confirmation? From the Gospels and the book of Acts, because Matthew agrees, Mark agrees, Luke agrees, John agrees, Acts agree, that John the Baptist is sent to prepare for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. And yet Jesus and Mark state, John is the messenger of Malachi 3.1, sent to prepare for the coming of the Lord to his temple. Did everyone get it? Do I need to give you further proof or is this clear? Do you guys need further proof or this is clear? Okay. Folks, now let's put our thinking caps on, connect the dots, do some math. Okay. Number one, Malachi 3.1 states, the Lord is going to send a messenger before him to prepare for the coming of Ha'adan, the Lord, a phrase used only of Jehovah, to his temple in Jerusalem. Since the temple belongs to Jehovah, that means the Lord that is coming to his temple is Jehovah God. But a messenger will come to prepare for his coming, preparing the people for the appearance of Jehovah God. Number one. Number two, the New Testament says that messenger sent to prepare for the coming of Jehovah to his temple is John the Baptist. Point number three. John the Baptist came to prepare for the coming of Jesus. And Jesus shows up immediately after John the Baptist is on the scene. Announcing to people the coming of Jesus. Conclusion. Jesus is the Ha'adan, the Lord, and the temple in Jerusalem belongs to Jesus. Jesus owns that temple. He is the Lord to whom the temple belongs. Did it sink in? We already all covered that air church. Did it sink in? Okay. This is why Jesus could say the following. Let's read Matthew 23, 21. Oh, it's going to get even better than that Jesus way to heaven. Oh, it's we're, this is just warm up. Wait, it's going to get better. You think you're blown away? Well, hold on. Yeah, hit that like button. Notice what Jesus says about the temple. Whoever swears by it. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. So when you swear by the temple, you're also swearing by the one who lives in the temple. 
Jesus, who lives in the temple? God does. But wait, Matthew 12, 6 to 8. Matthew 12, verse 6 and 8. Skip verse 7. Matthew 12, 6 and 8. Okay. Matthew 12, 6 and 8. Luke Rappaport, you don't need to post for us. Notice what Jesus says. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. He's talking about himself. In this place, one greater than the temple is here. Who? Look who he, who he claims to be. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Okay, Jesus just said, you Jews, there's someone here, one here greater than this temple, and it's me, the Son of Man, and I own the Sabbath. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, here's the problem. So Jesus said that if you swear by the temple, you're not just swearing by the temple, but you're swe swearing by him who lives in it. So God is in the temple. To say you're greater than the temple and you're not God, you just said you're greater than God. You see the logic? If I swear by the temple, I'm swearing by the temple and the God who lives in it. So if I say I'm greater than the temple and I'm not God, I said I'm greater than God. Wait, that would be blasphemy. That would be blasphemy. The only way Jesus can say he's greater than the temple is if he's the owner of the temple, the owner of the house who lives in it. Because the owner of the house is greater than the house. Who does Jesus think he is? Is it sinking in? Because notice his logic in Matthew 23, 21. You swear by the temple, you're swearing by him who lives in the temple. So if I say I'm greater than the temple, then I'm saying I'm greater than the one who lives in the temple. Blasphemous for a creature. But Jesus says, once standing here, me, I'm greater than this temple, and I'm the very Lord of the Sabbath. Two things that no creature can say. Why? Because the Sabbath belongs to Jehovah. He owns it. He's Lord over it. He tells you what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. And if you don't obey the Lord of the Sabbath and how to observe the Sabbath, he will punish you. Exodus 31, Exodus 31, 17. Exodus 31, 17. Exactly, Dominus Telkom, if he's not God. Look what Jehovah says to Moses. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Jehovah made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So he's saying, this is my Sabbath that you're to observe, right? If you read 12 to 17. Leviticus 23, verse 3. We should have read 12 to 16, but that's okay. You get the point. Leviticus 23, verse 3. Leviticus 23, 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Jehovah in all your dwellings. It's the Sabbath that belongs to Jehovah, which is why Jehovah commands you to observe it. Okay, wait. If the Sabbath belongs to Jehovah, he owns it, and he demands that you rest on it, and he tells you what you can and cannot do because he owns the Sabbath. Jesus, how dare you say, you the Son of Man are Lord of the Sabbath? And it's not just in Matthew he says that. Matthew 12, 8. 12, 8. Let's look at Mark 2, 28. King of kings, they'll come up with anything and everything to get around it. Believe me. Mark 2, 28. Does Jesus say in Mark, he's the Lord of the Sabbath? Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also the Sabbath. So Matthew and Mark have Jesus saying the same thing. I, the Son of Man, am the Lord of the Sabbath. What about Luke 6, 5? Luke chapter 6, verse 5. Does Luke say that Jesus said he's the Lord of the Sabbath? Luke 6, 5. And he said unto them this, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Wait, Jesus, you just said you're the one greater than the temple and you're Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah. But wait, the Sabbath belongs to Jehovah. He owns it. Okay. And you said if you say something about the temple, then you say something about who lives in the temple. Yeah. So if you say you're greater than the temple and you're not God, didn't you just say you're greater than God? And his point is, who told you I'm not God? 
Who told you I'm not God? You, you understand what's happening here? If you're not God and you're a creature and you say you're greater than the temple, that means you're greater than God. But he's saying, who told you I'm not God? I am the God of the house. And because I'm the owner of the house, I'm greater than the house. So no, I didn't say I'm greater than God. I'm greater than the temple because I am the God of the temple. That's his point. Did everyone get it now? So Jesus is greater than the temple, and he's the Lord of the Sabbath. But Jesus said, if you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the temple and the one who lives in it. So if I say anything against the temple or for the temple, I'm saying something against or for God. So if I'm a creature and I say I'm greater than the temple, that means I said I'm greater than God. Blasphemy. But if you're God and you own the temple, then yes, you are greater than your house. Only God can say that, which is why Jesus could say, yeah, I'm greater than the house. And I'm the Lord of the Sabbath because I am Jehovah who owns the house and owns the Sabbath. So is it clear, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Malachi 3.1, that messenger that was sent is John the Baptist? And is it clear that John the Baptist, according to that prophecy, was sent to prepare for Ha'adan, the Lord, who's going to come to his temple, meaning that John, who's that messenger, is sent to prepare for Jehovah God? Is that clear? Yeah, right? But wait, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts say, John the Baptist was sent to prepare for Jesus. Conclusion, Jesus is the Lord, Ha'adan, a phrase used only of Jehovah. And the temple belongs to him because it's his temple that he's coming to. Because John is the messenger sent to prepare for the coming of Jehovah to his temple. And yet that Jehovah that John prepared for was none other than Jesus our Lord. Okay, if that sunk in. This will answer the question asked by, was it David or Daniel? I forget. Danzinger? Jehovah is the name of who? Jehovah is the name of the Father, the name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit, because they're the one God. So my question is, the temple in Jerusalem belongs to who? Does it belong to Jesus? Yes. But then Jesus says, it's also his Father's house. Let's go to Luke 2. Let's read 41 to 50. Luke 2, 41 to 50. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Pay attention. I love the passage. Listen to this. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company. So it was a large company that traveled. So large that they could miss Jesus meaning that they didn't realize Jesus wasn't part of the company. When a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, guys, I want you to catch something. Pay attention. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. Pay attention, 46. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing him and asking them questions. We're going to revisit 46 in a minute. Get ready to be blown away. After they, three days, they found him in the temple in Jerusalem. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. They were blown away. This 12-year-old, where's he getting this wisdom from? Ah, but catch it. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father, meaning Joseph and I, have sought thee sorrowing. 49. Get ready to be blown away, guys. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? What wist did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Now, 
I'm about my father's business, meaning I'm here in the temple doing my father's business because this is my father's house. That's why other versions say in my father's house. Okay, now I'm confused, Jesus. Is this temple your father's house or is it your house? Well, if it's my father's house, it's my house because I'm a son and his heir. So what he owns, I own. What it belongs to him belongs to me. So if it's my father's house, it's the son's house, it's my house. You want proof? Luke 20, 13 and 14. Who is Jesus? Luke 20, 13 and 14. Ah, but I'm going to blow you away. Ah, oh, wait, man. And let me read 50. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. They were like baffled. What's going on here? Wait, you guys going to really, you want to get, you want to talk about mic drop? Jesus narrating the parable of the, the tenants, the vineyard, speaking of himself in the parable, then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. So the Lord of the vineyard is the father, beloved son is Jesus. Jesus is speaking, narrating his parable. He's the beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance be, will be ours. So Jesus in the parable says, I am the beloved son of the owner of the vineyard. The vineyard is Jerusalem. He owns all of it. But I am his heir. As his beloved son, what he owns belongs to me. It's my inheritance. So wait, Jesus. If your father owns Jerusalem, and he owns the temple, and you're the heir to your father, his beloved son and heir. Are you saying you own Jerusalem and the temple? Yep, it's mine. It's no wonder one author can say the temple belongs to you, Jesus. But another author can say it belongs to your father. And another author says it belongs to Jehovah. Because the Jehovah who owns Jerusalem and temple happens to be the father and the son along with the spirit. Did it sink in? And you want to convince me the Bible is not supernatural. It's not mind-blowing. It's not the Word of God. And that the God of the Bible is not mind-blowing and that he's not real. You're kidding me, right? Of course, Sample, he did. Because he's aware that he's the Son of God at the age of 12. He's aware that... He's in the temple of his father doing his father's will. And he's aware that his priority is God the father, not his parents. Because remember, they were gone for three days, meaning it took them three days to get back. So you're telling me in three days he didn't know they were gone? You mean at night when he went to sleep, he's not saying, oh, where's Mary? Right? But here, let me blow you away. You ready? You guys ready to get blown away? Come on, man. I love to blow you guys away because I want you. You know, you know what my goal is as a teacher? That the Holy Spirit will use me to cause me and every one of you, all of us, to fall so in love with Jesus and to be so in awe of Jesus, of the God who lives, Father, Son, Spirit, and just sit back and say, whoa, what are you? Who are you? You are beyond understanding. And I'm in love with you. Because you're in love with me. That's what I want to accomplish in my life. Till the day I die and Christ comes down. But now, wait. Hold on, man. Luke 2, 48, 49. Wait, man. Wait. Let's Luke 2, 48, 49. <laughs> I like Gabriel. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. Uh if Jesus wants me around, I won't die. It's not beyond, you know. Wait, now catch what Jesus is. You see, you guys didn't pay attention to Jesus' response. Yep, exactly. Bill, Bill got it. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. You made your father and me sorrowful looking for you. And Jesus tells her, what are you talking about? My father isn't sorrowful. I'm with my father in his house, a reminder to her who his real father is. And he said unto them, how is it that you sought me? Why were you looking for me? Don't you know that I'm here about my father's business? 
Mary, what do you mean? My father is sorrowful looking for me, worried, sick looking for me. I've been with my father every day. I'm here with my father. This is my true home. This is the temple of my father, and he lives here, and it's my home, and I'm with my father. So my father isn't worried, sick, looking for me. I'm with him. He's with me. Did you catch it? Send Athanasius to Mount Athos so they can cast the demon out of him. Do you understand what he just did? He's reminding her because her motherly instincts took over. And the Lord prevented them from fully comprehending who the son was so they could function as his parents. Because if they truly understood that this was God in the flesh, then they couldn't raise him. Because think about it. If Mary truly, truly understood who this person was, she's going to say, how can I raise you? You need to tell me what to do. You need to tell me what to feed you. And you need to tell me how to cook. You're... So God in his mercy, the Holy Spirit in his mercy, didn't allow Joseph and Mary to fully comprehend who the child was so they could function as his parents. So her motherly instincts took over. Why are you doing this to us, Jesus? Because think about it, folks. If she really understood from the depth of her being, this is God in the flesh, you know what she would say? Hey, don't worry about it. He's God. This is the son of God. He made us. He'll be fine. We'll see him at home. Right? Right? Right, If she truly comprehended this is God in the flesh and that God in his mercy didn't prevent her from comprehending who the child was, do you think she would have worried? She goes, oh, Joseph, what are you worried about? You know who he is. Remember I conceived him as a virgin? I gave birth to him as a virgin supernaturally, no man touching me? That's the eternal son, our Savior. He'll be fine. Let's go home. What you're saying here is that as an act of mercy and grace, God does not allow, God does not allow Mary and Joseph to fully comprehend who the child truly is. It's not sinking in completely, but he's veiled them from fully understanding who the child is in order to enable them to act as his parents. You get the point? You guys understand what I just said? Well, these Rosario. They were getting glimpses that he's God in the flesh, and they understood he was claiming to be God in the flesh, but it wasn't sinking in, and they couldn't comprehend or accept it. That's why they're baffled. Why does he speak like this? Who does he think he is? How can he do what he's doing? Man, he speaks as if he's God. He does things that only God can do, but he can't be God. He's a Jewish man, flesh and blood like us. So they're puzzled, right? And go to Luke 18, 34. Let me prove this point because that answers another objection. Well, well, doesn't Mary know he's God? Why is she worried? Who told you she was able to fully comprehend that reality? And who told you that God didn't veil her from fully understanding as an act of grace so that she can function as his mother? Here, Luke 18, 34. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Did you catch it? It was hid from them. They were prevented from fully understanding the reality of the one standing before them so that they could function around him. Okay. Let me, let me repeat what I'm trying to say. I want you to get this. You got to understand this. If Peter truly understood this is God in the flesh, he couldn't last a second in his prison presence. Let me prove it. You remember that miraculous catch of fish in Luke 5 where Peter all day, all night is trying to catch fish. He can't. But then when Jesus says, throw your net, right, he caught so much fish that other boats had to come and help him so he wouldn't capsize and the net wouldn't break. Just that miracle scared him to the point he says, depart from me, Lord, from I am an evil man. He realizes his unworthiness to stand in his presence. So can you imagine if Peter fully understood this is God in the flesh? He would either say, please depart from me because I can't be in your presence because I can't function because I'm second guessing everything I'm about to think because I know you're God and you know what I'm about to say before I say it. So I'm, I'm trembling or change me in such a way where I can dwell in your presence. Luke 5, 7 to 8. See again, because we're live streaming, I have to take a break. 
Luke 5, 7 to 8. So you know I'm not making it up. Luke 5, read. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. I can't be in your presence. I'm too wicked to be in your presence. See, if they fully comprehend, comprehend it every second, every day, who Jesus was, they couldn't be in his presence. They said, we can't function. I can't breathe. I'm scared to even think. So either change me or leave me. That's why God remains invisible to us. It's an act of mercy so that we can function in these sinful bodies. Because can you imagine if the veil of heaven was removed and you can see God on the throne and Jesus on the throne and the angels every day, every second, you couldn't live. You say, take me out of here. You couldn't be intimate with your spouse. You couldn't play. You couldn't do anything if God removed the veil where you could see him clearly as you're seeing me. Not in these sinful bodies. Why do you think God is going to have to transform your bodies to be sinless and perfect so now you can dwell in his presence because you won't have any sinful thoughts, desires, actions, or words so you can stand in his presence and be okay? Right? Is it making sense? Now let's go to Luke 2, 50 to 51. Luke 2, 50 to 51. Watch here. To prove what I just said, that Mary and Joseph, as act and mercy, as an act of grace and mercy, are not allowed to fully comprehend who the child is. Luke 2, 50 to 51. Watch here. I'm going to have to take a short break. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. They didn't understand. See, they were baffled. What is he saying? I'm about my father's business. They didn't comprehend. Now watch what it says here. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Did you catch it? His mother kept these sayings in her heart. She started pondering, what's going on here? My child is truly amazing. Even though I was told he's the son of God, I really don't understand. I really haven't comprehended what that means that he's the son of God. You see? But now notice Jesus' humility. It says he willfully subjected himself to them as to not cause them trouble or to stumble. Did you catch it, Luke 2.51? And he was subject unto them. He willfully subjected himself so he wouldn't cause them to stumble and be scandalized that they had God in the flesh living in the house, sleeping in the next room. You see, it was mercy, it was grace, it was love on the part of the Trinity, on the part of Jesus, to prevent them from fully understanding who this was that's living in my house. Who's this one that's sleeping in that bed? Who's this one who's waking up every morning with a smile and hugging me? Who is this one that I'm bathing? Who is this one that I'm cooking for? Can you imagine Joseph? If you understood this is God, what can I teach him? So you understand what he said in Luke 2, 48 to 49? You understand what he said, Luke 2, 48, 49? Mary, motherly instincts takes over. She forgets who this child is. Why have you done this to us? We've been worried, sick, looking for you, your father and I. And he says, what do you mean, my father? My father hasn't been worried, sick. Mary, I'm with my father in his house doing his business. My father is perfectly fine. And they didn't understand. They're like, what is he talking about? What do you mean you're about your father's business? And then that moment, Joseph, he truly is the son of God. See, I'm getting chills. I am truly the mother of our Lord. He truly is the son of God. God is truly his father. See, I'm getting chills, guys. See, my hair is sticking up. For a moment, that glimpse. Yes, I want to get there, sort of, sort of truth. 
Is it amazing or what? Right? But now I'm going to give you, just give me a second. I'm going to give you what three days means in a minute. And you guys think this blew you away? <laughs> Don't you love the Bible? And isn't our God amazing? And isn't he worthy that we are in love with him? And what an honor that Jesus would choose a maggot like me. Someone by the world standards, uneducated, right? And set me apart and say, you, my servant, and this is for all of us, because I love you and I'm in love with you, I'm going to give you wisdom to break down my word and share it with my children and my servants so that all of you will be in awe of me and fall in love with me. What an honor. What an honor. And I beg the Lord, Lord, please, please keep us in love with you. Keep me in love with you. And Lord, please never let us go and save us for your glory to die glorifying you, to live for you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We, we, we love you. Even though I fail you, Lord, you will never fail me. You'll never fail us or my daughters. But just give me one minute. I'm going to talk about three days. But guys, because it's live stream, stuff happens. And because stuff happens, guess what? I got to do something. A little bird is calling me. Chirp, chirp. But I'll leave you entertained. I'll leave you entertained. Okay. No, I'm not going to play. No, no. This one got me in trouble. <laughs> I even got to know what to play because you got a lot of haters here. Okay. Give me a second. Okay, did you guys hear that song? That's an Assyrian song that's so depressing that it makes me want to throw myself out of the first floor window and hang myself with my shoestrings. All right, now you ready for the three days? You guys ready for the three days? Luke 2, 47. Luke 2, 47. Let's reread a sort of truth. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. It was Luke 2, 46. I apologize. Luke 2, 46. I apologize because I'm caught in the moment. Yep. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. So where was Jesus after three days? In the temple, right? After three days, he was in the temple, right? Right? He was in the temple after three days, right? John 2, 19 and 22. John 2, 19 and 22. Should connect this with yesterday's teaching. John 2, 19 and 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body, a foreshadowing that after three days, Jesus would be back in his temple, his physical body. After three days, he was in the temple. 
destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. I'll be back in my temple again, my physical body. Did you guys see that or no? You see, everything is placed there for a reason by the Holy Spirit. It's not a coincidence. After three days, they found him in the temple as a picture that after three days, Jesus would be in his temple again, the temple of his physical body that he resurrected. Now, and the temple in Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, not only was Jesus in the temple, but the Father was in the temple, right? The Father was in the temple. Right? The Father is in the temple. The Son is in the temple. And the Spirit is in the temple, right? Okay. John 10, 37 to 38. John 10, 37, 38. Get ready to be blown away. John 10, 37, 38. Yep, Jojo. It's all pointing to his resurrection. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe me not, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Just like the temple in Jerusalem, the father was there dwelling in it. The father was also dwelling in the physical temple of Jesus. John 14, 9 to 11. John 14, 9 to 11. John 14, 9 to 11. A lot of stuff, huh? Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believe thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So wait, just like the temple in Jerusalem, the Father was in it. He was dwelling there. So was the Son and the Spirit. Likewise, the physical body of Jesus, the true temple of God, not only was Jesus dwelling in it, the Father is dwelling in it, and the Holy Spirit. John 1, 32 to 33. John 1, 32 to 33. Right, John 14, 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode up upon him. It abode upon him. Hmm. Then 33. Watch here. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So wait. The Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit were all indwelling the physical body, the physical temple of Jesus. Really? Oh, but wait, it's going to get a little better. Mark 1.10. Yes, we all dwell in the Father because of Jesus' temple. And he says, I am in you. And the Father's in me. So if he's in us and the Father's in him, then the Father's in us. That's what he says. Now, Mark 1.10. Guys, you won't see it because in English translation. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Now, do you see that word, upon? Descending upon him? Upon him? The Greek preposition is ace or ice. East, you know what east means? It also means into, in. It can mean in or into. So one way of translating it is, and the Holy Spirit came into him, into him, into him. Here, don't believe me? The Greek preposition is right there, east, or if you want to pronounce ice. That's the word east that can mean into or in. So one way of translating is that the Holy Spirit came into him. Check it out. It's there, the preposition. Now, there is a word that can mean upon you, and that's the word epi. 
E-P-I, epi can mean upon or, you know, on. I'm not saying east cannot mean upon, but east is also the preposition that means in or into. So notice that Mark by inspiration didn't choose the word epi, E-P-I, upon. He chose the preposition ace or ice, into. So the spirit came into him. Wow. Exactly, medic. Epidermis. Dermis is dermatology skin, epi, upon the skin. Excellent. Those are two words from the Greek combined. Yep, Bill Thompson. Eisegesis. Eisegesis reading into. Exegesis, ek, out of. Man, you guys are geniuses. Okay. Have you guys been blown away thus far? Abd al halaj Allah Akbar. So far, a lot of me. Clear? Everyone getting it? So, like the temple in Jerusalem, the Father was present there, the Son is present there, was present there, the Holy Spirit. And similarly, Jesus' physical body is the temple. So not only does Jesus dwell in that body because it's his human nature, because he became man, but the Father dwells in it and the Spirit dwells in it. <whistles> wow. No wonder Luke is giving you a foreshadow in Luke 2.46. After three days, Jesus was found in the temple, was in the temple. Because it's a foreshadow of Jesus resurrecting his body and entering into his body once again, that body being the temple of God. So do you see how Malachi 3.1 proves Jesus is Ha-Adan, the Lord, and the temple in Jerusalem belongs to him as it belongs to the Father. So notice the prophecy says the one to come after the John the Baptist is sent to prepare is Jehovah God, because the phrase Ha'adan is only used of Jehovah, and the temple belongs to Jehovah, and the one to come after John is Ha'adan, and the temple is his, and it's none other than Jesus Christ. So who is Jesus according to Malachi 3.1? Ha'adan, the phrase used only of Jehovah. And the temple belongs to who according to Malachi 3.1? Jesus. The Lord, Ha'adan, who came to it. Now, are you ready for the rebuttal by Chris LaSala, who did an hour session trying to refute me, and I did a Skype refuting him, which he never recorded, because, again, he exposes true colors. I try to give him the benefit of the doubt, no more. He is an agent of the devil. He needs to be exposed and shamed until he repents, if he does. Talk about Joseph for what? Guess what he says? You know how he interprets Malachi 3.1? He says the Malachi 3.1 is not about Jesus as the Lord who comes to his temple. He's saying that Malachi 3.1 is prophesying that the Father will tabernacle in the physical body of Jesus. So the temple is Jesus' body, and the Lord is the Father who's going to live in it. You understand his exegesis? Let me repeat his exegesis. Tell me this is not de desperate. Here's his exegesis. The Lord there is God the Father. And when it says he's coming to his temple, we know the New Testament is not about the body of Christ. So it's not about the Father dwelling the body of Christ. It's not calling Jesus the Lord. And it's not saying the temple belongs to Jesus. It's saying the Father will come to his temple, and that temple is the body of Jesus. So when Jesus became flesh, the Father dwelt in it. You see how desperate he is? To try to explain any witness to Jesus being Jehovah God? If you understood the objection, let me now decimate it by the grace of the triune God. If you understand his desperate, pathetic perversion of scripture, I will now address it by the triune God. Do you, who didn't get the objection? Focus, Susan. Focus. Who didn't get the objection? Okay, Hafsa, when it says in Malachi 3.1, the Lord will come to his temple, he's saying that means the Father will come and dwell in Jesus' physical body, 
Because the temple there is Jesus' physical body. Who didn't get it now? If I, I'm going to try to repeat it one more time. You don't get it, I can't. then I can't help you see the point. So Malachi 3 is saying, the Lord, meaning the Father, is coming to his temple, meaning the body of Jesus. So it's saying that the Father is the Lord, and he's coming to dwell in Jesus' physical body. That's the temple. Jesus is not Jehovah and according to him. He's the son of Jehovah. No, he believes Jesus is God, but he's not Jehovah. He believes the Father is Jehovah, and he's a higher God than Jesus, D. Rosario. Go listen to my discussion. At least he left part one. I think he did. Hope he wasn't dishonest enough to remove it. Abdel Haraj, he's saying, no, Jesus is the temple. He's not the owner of it. That's his objection. But are you now ready for me to show you why the New Testament is a nightmare for Muslims, a nightmare for Jehovah's Witnesses, a nightmare for Unitarians, exposing them all as heretics and sons and daughters of the devil, unless they repent? Are you guys ready or no? I just want to make sure you get the objection so we can refute it. You ready? Who didn't get it? I'll try one more time. Repeat it. Okay. I love the New Testament because it's the true word of the triune God. And because the triune God is truly God, the New Testament perfectly reveals that God is triune. Because, guys, this is where he didn't know how to answer. Let me show you how Malachi 3.1 reads in the New Testament. Pay attention. Malachi 3.1. Let's look at Malachi 3.1. Pay attention now. If you guys, here's where you're going to know that you pay attention carefully and actually understand what you read. Okay, watch here. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Did you catch it? The one speaking says, I will send my messenger, and he'll prepare the way before me, right? I will send my messenger to prepare me for me, right? I forgot the finger. I, my, me. Ah, hold on. And suddenly the Lord whom you, whom you seek will come to his temple. But now let's go to Mark 1, 2. Let's see if you catch it. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face which shall prepare thy way before thee. It's now two divine persons. I will send my messenger before your face. It's no longer before me. It's before you, someone distinct. And he'll prepare your way before you. What was God speaking in first person singular, I, my, me, is now one divine person speaking of another divine person to another divine person. I will send my messenger before your face to prepare your way before you. So the New Testament takes Malachi 3.1 and identifies the God who's speaking as two persons, the Father speaking to the Son. Did you catch it or no? I don't think you caught it. In Malachi 3.1, it's God saying, I will send my messenger ahead of me. So it's same person, singular pro, uh, pro, uh, pronoun. Or we can say same being, not person. I, my messenger ahead of me. But now the New Testament has the Father quoting Malachi 3 as he's speaking to the Son. So it's now the Father saying to the Son, Son, I will send my messenger ahead of your face to prepare your way before you. So it's no longer first person singular speaking of himself. I will send my messenger out of me. It's one person speaking to another person saying, I will send a messenger to prepare your way. In other words, we still end up with Jesus being the Lord coming to the temple and not Jesus being the temple. Did you catch it or no? 
No, in, in Malachi 3.1, Medic, it's not the son referring to himself. It's the Godhead speaking. It's the Godhead speaking in the singular. But the New Testament now explains to us, though it's the Godhead speaking, it's actually two persons of the Godhead, the one Godhead, two persons of the Godhead, where one person says to the other person, you're going to show up and I'll send my messenger to prepare for you to show up in your temple. So let me explain what's happening in Malachi 3.1. It's the one Godhead speaking. I will send my messenger ahead of me, one Godhead. But the New Testament then breaks it down and shows that one Godhead is more than one person because it's one person of the Godhead sending his messenger to prepare the way for the other person of the Godhead. Did you get it? You got it. So the New Testament breaks down Malachi 3.1 as the Trinity or the Godhead, not a singular person. So if you read Malachi 3.1, you would get the impression it's a singular person. But the New Testament says, no, wrong impression. It's not a singular person. It's a singular Godhead. It's the one Godhead speaking, but that one Godhead is more than one person. And in light of the New Testament, it's the Father saying to the Son, I'm sending my messenger out of you, Son, to prepare for your face, Son. So he goes ahead of you. Did it sink in? One more time, because I'm going to take my time with this. Malachi 3.1. Notice singular. Singular. I will send my messenger before my face, right? And then suddenly the Lord whom you see shall come to his temple, even the angel of the Lord whom you desire, says the Lord of hosts. So notice what New Testament did. Took that first part. I will send my messenger out of me before my face. Okay. But now the New Testament quotes it. I will send my messenger before your face. To prepare your path for you. What was a singular being in Malachi 3.1 becomes a multi-personal being in the New Testament. So that Jesus is not the temple. He still ends up being the Lord coming to his temple. You got it? Did you get it? Jesus quotes it the same way, Matthew 11.10. You should have seen how Chris shut down and got discombobulated. He didn't know how to answer this. He goes, wait, 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 what do you mean? It's right in front of you, dude. And he never recorded it because I trust him enough to record it, and I was dumb. Now let's see how Jesus quotes it, Matthew 11.10. Jesus is speaking, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face which shall prepare thy way before thee. See, even Jesus quotes it this way. So Jesus says, it's the Father speaking to me, the Son. The Father saying to me, he's going to send his messenger before me to prepare my way for my face as I come to the temple. You caught it or no? I want it to sink in. Now, what if someone says, oh, man, see, you're proving New Testament is distorting the Old Testament. You're proving New Testament butchers the, New, uh, the Old Testament. No. You know why? Because you guys are not reading carefully. Even Malachi 3.1 shows you it's two divine persons. Did you know that? Even Malachi 3.1 shows you it's two divine persons, if you read carefully. You want me to show you where Malachi 3.1 shows it's two divine persons, not one and the same? You want me to show you? Yeah. See, this is where I'm testing you. This is why I say it's not enough that you read. Read with understanding. Read with understanding. Okay. 
Let's reread it. Malachi 3.1. Let's read it. Watch. Yeah, pray that God will grant them repentance. Epic, do you want me to send you on your merry way? Where is the muzzles that can muzzle you? Malachi 3.1. Behold, I will send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, notice now, he speaks of someone else in the third person. Whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Why did he change the grammar? Why didn't he say, and then I, the Lord, will suddenly come to my temple, and I will come, saith the Lord of hosts. So it was right there in front of you, two divine persons. It's right there, two divine persons. Uh, Emic, I would like your birth certificate to prove that your mother wasn't a dog and that a Rottweiler gave birth to a dog like you. Get out of here, dude. Get lost, you wicked demon. Malachi 3.1. One more time. One more time. Let's read it. It's going to get deeper. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, notice he didn't say, and I, the Lord, and the Lord whom you seek, and shall suddenly come to his temple. He didn't say my temple. Even the message of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Why did you change the pronouns, God? Because I'm referring to another divine person, distinct from me who's showing up. So neither Jesus nor Mark distorted Malachi. They brought out the deeper meaning of Malachi that was there for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Don't waste your time with dogs. We muzzle them and shut them up. But you guys got it? Oh, but wait. You, you still didn't get it. You know that Lord that was coming to his temple? You know which person of the Godhead? He happens to be, even without the New Testament. Put the New Testament aside. Did you know Malachi 3.1 told you that the Lord who owns the temple is not the Father? He told you in that verse? In that verse? Because notice what God said. Then suddenly the Lord whom you seek will come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you people desire. The Lord is the messenger of the covenant. Guess what the word messenger is in Hebrew? It's the word angel. So right there, Malachi told you that the Lord who's coming to the temple is none other than the angel of the covenant, the angel of God of the Old Testament, the angel who's distinct from God, who is God, does things that only God can do, whom God calls God and who's worshipped as God. That's the one who's coming to his temple. That's the one who becomes Jesus of Nazareth. Send this dog to his dog that gave birth to him, filthy dog. Und you. Okay. Thankfully, it wasn't your mother that gave the Old Testament. It was the triumph God. The dogs are coming up manifesting. Send them. Yep. The word messenger of the covenant, the Hebrew word is malach. Even though it's spelled malach, it's malach. That's the word for angel. It's literally the angel of the covenant. Here, let me give you the link. So guess who the Ha'adan, the Lord is, who's coming to his temple? God tells you. The Lord who owns the temple is none other than the angel of the covenant. He's coming. So it's God the Father saying, the Lord who owns the temple is coming, who's none other than the angel of the covenant. So the New Testament perfectly understood Malachi 3.1. There you go. Here you go. Malachi 3.1, the interlinear. Look at the word for angel, or messenger. Behold, I send my malach, my angel. That's John the Baptist. So John is called an angel, malach. And he will prepare the way before me, la pane, my face. And suddenly will come to his temple, the Lord Ha'adon, whom you seek, even the messenger, 
Malach ha barith, the messenger, the angel of the covenant. Wow. So right there, right there, in front of your eyes in Malachi 3.1, you had two divine persons being mentioned. It starts with the Godhead speaking to the Father speaking of the other divine person who is the Lord, who owns the temple, who is the angel of the covenant, whom the New Testament says is Jesus Christ. No wonder Mark and Jesus quotes it the way they do, where they have God the Father speaking to the Son about John the Baptist being sent to prepare for the Son, the Son coming to his temple. In other words, Jesus is not the temple that the Father comes to. Jesus is the Lord who's coming to the temple. Did it sink in or no? Did you catch it? Here is a passage where Jesus is called Ha'adan, phrase used only of Jehovah, where the temple of Jerusalem is said to belong to him. It's his temple, showing that he's Jehovah, and where he's called the angel of the covenant. What angel of what covenant? Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5, and we're going to wrap things up. Amazing, right? I don't know why he quoted Jude. Oh, this is Jude. Which part of Judges wasn't clear in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5? That's why you can only give me Jude 1. Protestant, you're dropping the ball today, bro. I'm getting upset, man. I'm going to have to hurt you. And he gives me Judges 1 again. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. al Masihu Akbar, al Masihu Akbar. Judges chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. You can keep the bonus verses. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. I need it, Nathan. Keep praying. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. Before the rapture, Protestant, we left you behind. Judges 2, verses 1 to 5. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. Notice how he talks to Bochim. And said, the angel said, notice how he speaks. Guys, read, please. You got to get this. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I, the angel speaking, I made you go to go up out of Egypt and have brought you up unto the land, which I swear unto your father. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Hey, angel, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you're saying it's your covenant that you made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Israelites? Who do you think you are to say, you made the oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to bring their descendants into Israel, uh, into Canaan. Who do you think you are that you're saying that you brought them up out of Egypt? Now let's read. Continue. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down the, their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Now notice 3 to 5. 3 to 5. Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out. You said you'll not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides. And their God shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of Jehovah spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of the place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto Jehovah. Wait, why does the angel say, it's my covenant that I swore to your fathers. I brought you up out of the land into Canaan. And I said, obey my voice. And if you do, I'll drive them out because you didn't obey me. I won't drive them out. Who do you think you are, angel? Why do you think it's your covenant? Because it is mine. Tie it in with Malachi 3.1. Here's the angel of the covenant who is the Lord who comes to his temple after John the Baptist prepares for his coming. And that angel of the covenant who is Ha'adan the Lord to whom the temple belongs is now known as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Did you get it? So much for Chris LaSala and his blasphemy. May the triumph God have mercy and bring him to the truth. If not, may the triumph God give him what he deserves. 
May the triune God save us from Satan, from Satan's children, from the kingdom of darkness, from this world, from this corrupt system. Save us and our loved ones. Save us and our families. Save my daughters by covering us with the blood of Jesus, shielding us with the blood of Jesus, and surrounding us with a wall of fire from his Holy Spirit. And may he crucify our flesh and give us victory over the flesh to walk in the life of the Spirit, to love him more, to adore him more, to proclaim him more, and to live for him and even die for him. The Father, Son, and Spirit, the one true God, Yahovah, God Almighty. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and please help us. Guys, pray for me. I'm going to settle in my new place February 15. I need the gracious provisions of the Lord to provide overabundantly to take care of my daughters, take care of my bills, stand on my feet to do this work, to be holy for the Lord, and also that he'll continue to help me to get healthier in Jesus' name. Now, here's the thing. Do you guys want me to do another live stream on why the Quran cannot be the word of Allah? I mean, not Allah. The word of God. Do you want me to do another live stream today? God willing, if Jesus wills. How many of you want me to do a live stream right after this? How many ones? Are you guys tired? Because then the second live stream will be about the Quran. It's not going to be about the Bible. All right. Okay, now it's 5.11 my time, which means it's 7.11 Eastern Standard Time. 7.11 New York Time. We'll start. 8.30 Eastern Standard Time, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. I'm sorry, 8.30, not to confuse you. We're going to start 8.30 Eastern Standard Time. That's New York Canadian Time, 6.30 p.m. Illinois Time. No, what am I talking about? I confused you again. All right. In Jesus' name, I'm not going to get it confused. 8.30 p.m. New York Time, Canadian Time, Eastern Standard Time. 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, which is Chicago time, Illinois time. 7.30 p.m., 8.30 p.m. 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, Chicago time. 8.30 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time. That means in an hour and a half, God willing, God willing, hour and a half. Okay? So those of you got to sleep, it will be archived. For those of you that are going to come, show up and invite people. I want about 80, 180 people. Christ is risen, is risen indeed. See you in about an hour and a half, God willing.